Good morning, Madison County Vineyard Church. Thank Good morning. you for that. Welcome of applause. Uh, we are here to continue the 2,000 year old celebration of our Lord Jesus Christ coming to be with us. Uh, and the words to the songs that we're going to sing are going to be on the screen so that you may be free to uh, worship as you are led. We just ask that you uh, let the Holy Spirit warm your heart and open your mind. And uh, as you sing along, just think about what God has done for you and what he has in store for you. Uh, for some of you, we welcome that you are here to rest from a week that has been difficult. And we are here to be in service to you as well as in service to our Lord. And uh, But we also ask that uh, those who are ready to uh, pray as they sing uh, for thoughts that come to mind about what they know other people are going through. We welcome that as well. Uh, if you like, you may stand. Would you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, we love you, and we are so happy that you have led us to this point in our lives where we are stepping into your presence, where we are stepping into your service, where we are stepping into your house so that we may be with you and sing to you and sing with the angels that are also praising you. Lord, we love you and we know that you will change us for the better, and we ask that you do that today and every day. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat.
stand back and see what you will do. We will stand back and let you move. Stand back and let you move. Stand back and see what you will do. See what you will do. Oh, oh, oh. 
do 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 as you will. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for pouring your spirit upon us in this service. Please continue to uh, minister to us in every way that helps us learn and listen and grow. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Please welcome Pastor Denny Tapman. <laughs> just mentioned. Uh, my name is uh, Denny and I'm uh, privileged to be one of the uh, pastors here on staff at the Vineyard. And I'm really glad you've chosen to worship with us today. I want to welcome as well uh, all of our family and friends who are joining us online. Uh, before we dismiss our young ones, I would like to first introduce you all to our newest members here at the Vineyard. Would the following individuals please stand? Tom and Kathleen Chrysler, Ron Miguel, and uh, John and Nicole Flynn. Welcome them. All right, thank you guys. Go ahead and be seated. They now know the secret handshake. So, <laughs> in the event you've been sitting around here for a while and you're going, I wonder, you know, what the benefits are of being a member of the Vineyard the secret handshake. That's pretty much it, but uh, uh, we're so glad you've chosen to uh, become part of the uh, Vineyard family. At this time, let's go ahead and dismiss the uh, young ones, ages three through the eighth grade, and their teachers to their classrooms. As they are making their way out, here are the morning announcements. First, if you feel led to give an offering today as a continued expression of your worship, Remember, you can do that by placing it in any of the drop boxes located by each of the sanctuary doors. You can give by going to our website or by using uh, our smartphone app, and you can, of course, also mail that offering in. As always, if you happen to be a guest with us today, please do not feel the need to give financially. You are in every way our guest, and we're just glad that you're here. Next, I'm going to remind you we are still looking for some individuals to join us for prayer each and every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. This group meets over in our prayer room, just in this hallway. And uh, let me say this. I mentioned this last week. Uh, prayer does move the hand that moves the world. And I think if there's ever been a time in our nation's history, now is the time for the people of God to be gathering and praying. Amen? And so I really want to encourage you, even if you can't commit to being uh, at this, this little prayer gathering each and every week, come when you can. Come once a month. Come whenever you can. There's great power when we come together and agree in prayer. And so I want to encourage you to come. Um, our coffee house overseers are also currently looking for some volunteers to help them sling coffee and create community. If you are interested in uh, knowing more or just learning how to make a good cup of coffee, because the world needs more of that, uh, stop by the uh, coffee house and speak with Tom and Kathleen. Kathleen, you can just raise your hand there. You can just talk with her. She'd love to uh, speak with you. And uh, last, I want to remind you that our youth ministry meets each and every Sunday from 4.30 until 6.30. Now, I'm not going to go off on a sermon here, but let me say this. I think this last week has shown us that our young people are struggling in very significant ways in this nation. And while I'm not going to make a, a value judgment of if even what this young man ha has done uh, when I look in his eyes, I see somebody who is really uh, injured, somebody who's really, really hurt, that if you have somebody, the, the, the fix-all, but there would be an extra set of eyes to look into this young man's eyes and make sure that he's doing okay. I think it's also important that we do what we can to get our youth in youth ministry because there are times that topics are going to come up that they're just not going to feel comfortable speaking to others about, and they may well speak to a youth pastor or a youth leader about. Uh, I think it's also a, a really good way for some of these younger people who right about now may have a lot of questions about, are they safe? Are they secure 
in, in, in school and in, in our environment as a whole. They need people to talk to. So, with that said, if you happen to be a teen, if you have neighbors who are teens and they are not involved in youth ministry, I really want to encourage you, do what you can to get them plugged in. If not here, get them plugged in someplace. All right. Well, guys, here we are just uh, weeks away from uh, Christmas and the New Year, a time that is absolutely filled with memories, and uh, for many of us, it is a time steeped with tradition, which can, uh, I suppose, on one hand, be a really good thing. After all, tradition can bring us a sense of being connected to something much larger than ourselves. It also connects us to our past and typically gives us both a sense of comfort and belonging. And as it comes to uh, traditions such as, as Christmas, it may also bring us a sense of anticipation for what is to come. Again, tradition can be a really good thing. But if I may, traditions can also be uh, occasionally uh, a bit silly. One example which uh, illustrates this which I found online, came from an individual who just said, quote, at Christmas, we sniff the packages before opening them. I don't know why. And most of the time, they just smell like unwrapped paper. Um, it's been going on for 20 years now. Well, it's easy, I suppose, to laugh at such a silly tradition. The reality is we can all be guilty of holding on to traditions, sometimes religiously so, even if we don't know why. For example, through the years, um, various individuals with churches that I've pastored have said the following to me. Denny, we can't have church without pews. Now, the reason they said that is when we first moved into this facility, it was just jam-packed with pews, and we gave them all away. And I was like, really? I didn't know that. I didn't know you couldn't do church without pews. But what I do know is pews were not even used in churches until sometime in the 13th century and weren't in common use until about the 16th century throughout the Reformation are you sure you can't do church without pews? Because it seems like 1,600 years people did, right? Are you sure? Or Denny, why isn't there a cross in the sanctuary or stained glass in the building? And I've heard that numerous times by visitors. You can't have church without these things, really. Even though the cross was never, believe it or not, part of of Christian worship until after the 3rd and some say as late as the 5th century? And stained glass wasn't commonly used in churches until the 17th century? Are you sure you can't have church without those things? Or my all-time favorite, and I've heard this so many times, Denny, the NIV, really? I mean... You know the only true Bible is the authorized King James Version of the Bible. I'm like, oh. So even though the King James Bible was printed in 1611, and over the last, I don't know, couple hundred years, people stopped speaking in King's English, it is still the only Bible anyone should ever read including those who do not speak English. They just need to catch up. Really? Well, these are just some of the traditions uh, people may be inclined to hold on to in the church. Of course, in the bigger picture, just to be clear, these are actually pretty harmless things, honestly, after all, they are not salvatory in nature. So in other words, what you believe about these things one way or the other isn't going to uh, either grant you, you know, entry into heaven or keep you from ever entering into heaven. It's not really all that critically important. Uh, nonetheless, I, I think they should serve as a reminder that 
that what we hold on to church religiously or traditionally in the church really should be based on scriptural and, I suppose, historical fact. Amen? And, and just so you know, this, this holding to tradition isn't just a, a modern uh, problem. Jesus also repeatedly addressed this very issue with a group of religious people in his day. We uh, read about one such occasion in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. If you have your Bibles, digital or traditional, you go ahead and go there now. This is the first of three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, known as the Synoptic Gospels. They're very similar in uh, their telling. They tell their uh, narratives of Jesus very differently, but uh, this is the first of the Gospels that was recorded. Here we read, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. And then some commentator somewhere along the line said, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. And then Mark continues. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Now, before we go any further, I should probably mention just a few things. The first is the Greek word used here for traditions is the word peridosis which simply means to pass on a tradition or, in specific, a teaching, to keep passing it along. Secondly, the Jewish law found in both the Ten Commandments and also the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, contains a, a certain number of detailed moral regulations and instructions that Jews were to apply to themselves, which most of the Jewish people were absolutely fine with what was written. But in the 4th and 5th centuries before Jesus' arrival, there came into being a class of, of legal experts whom we know as the scribes. These individuals were not content with the great moral principles found in these books. Rather, they had what can only be described as a passion for definition. In other words, they wanted these principles of God or these laws expanded and broken down into minute detail. So they issued thousands and, and thousands of little rules and regulations to govern every possible action and every possible solution or situation rather in life. And it was this micro regulation of the law that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were referring to when they said, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders? Not the traditions of God. Why don't they live according to the tradition of the elders? So in other words, why aren't your disciples obeying our laws? And in specific, the tradition of ceremonially washing their hands, which by the way, and it's important that you get this, was their way of saying, because the disciples didn't wash in this prescribed or traditional way, they were unclean and unfit for the service and worship of God. I mean, that's talking some major smack. 
Of course, Jesus wasn't going to put up with this, so he addressed these pious individuals and accused the scribes and the Pharisees, who were by all accounts the most religious people on the planet, of a few significant failings. The first was their hypocrisy. I want you to look again at Mark chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, teachings are but rules topped by men. Now something worth noting here is, is when Jesus calls these individuals hypocrites, he is not merely saying they are living out an inconsistent life with what they say they believe, as, as an actor might do, and that's how some interpret this passage, but it's a wrong interpretation. Rather, the word hypocrite here implies arrogance and hardness of heart, one who is utterly devoid of sincerity and genuineness. So how do these religious individuals end up in such a depraved state? Well, Jesus tells us it was their arrogance. Their arrogance. And how arrogant were they? <laughs> the scriptures and history both reveal these individuals were so arrogant. They honestly believed they were superior and had arrived at the pinnacle of holiness and righteousness. They were as close to God as any human being could possibly be. Additionally, they believed other religious sects, which they may have believed Jesus was starting, to be inferior to their own which meant on some level they believed all others were really missing the mark. Only they had this God stuff all figured out. Again, this can be seen, I think, in their dig at the disciples. And uh, while I don't want to stir up a hornet's nest here, and you know I'm getting ready to, (laughs) while I don't want to stir up a hornet's nest here, friends, I think the Christian church universally should also learn a lesson here and be very, very careful about thinking any one denomination has all the right answers, amen, or arrogantly believe even in our hearts others are somehow inferior or wrong if they don't hold to our doctrine or practice their faith in the, in the same way or manner we are accustomed to, or if you will, practice our traditions. Now, I realize you guys would never ever do that. Um, but believe me when I say, some do. This is exactly how some live. Some are utterly convinced anyone who practices a faith in any other way than they do are missing the mark. They're just wrong. And if I may, this is the very arrogance Jesus rebuked these religious groups for. In fact, these were the ones whom whom Jesus said, and this out of Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 and 24, Woe to you, that's like the worst, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, that same Greek word, you morally dead individuals, hard-hearted individuals, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, which we see in Exodus. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. And today, and maybe this is just my opinion, Some in the church, like the uh, Pharisees and scribes in our passage, seem to be 
Um, at times, fixating on certain components uh, or traditions of their faith, um, like how one is baptized, when one is baptized. They're, they're fixated on this. What version of the Bible one must read? What type of clothing should be worn in church or even that of the necessity of observing a Sabbath? They fixate on these things, yet neglect some of the weightier, more important aspects of the faith, like loving others, all others, as Christ has loved us. Think about that for a second. Gave his life for us, washed feet, chose to love us even when no one else did, even when we didn't even love ourselves. Or is that just me? Or how about serving others? Serving others in the body of Christ, caring for widows, orphans, and the marginalized in our uh, community, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they've done, regardless of whether or not they even agree with our particular convictions with respect to who Christ is. These friends were, again, the kind of things Jesus accused the scribes of not doing. They were, in his estimation, despite looking really good on the outside, filled with arrogance and hardness of hearts. They were utterly devoid of sincerity and genuineness when it came to the things of God. This being so, I think we should also be mindful, church, of holding too tightly to tradition, especially if it isn't centered on the more important matters of the faith. Amen? The second thing Jesus accused the scribes and, and Pharisees of was they, they had substituted the efforts of man for the laws of God. Again, it's very clear in Mark 7, verses 8 and 9. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Here Jesus is in essence saying, you guys have again substituted human ingenuity and know-how for the laws of God. And of course, Jesus was right. For example, these individuals, because they had life all figured out and God all figured out, no longer relied upon God for guidance. In fact, these, these legalists, despite looking or rather invoking God's name, didn't actually depend upon God for anything. Nothing. Nothing. And, and, and even worse, they wouldn't listen to what God had to say. I think the way they responded to Jesus is evidence of that. They just simply wouldn't listen to what God had to say. Rather, they depended upon and listened to the clever arguments, uh, debates, and the interpretations of the quote-unquote legal experts of their day. Now hold on to that. And today, many in our nation, and more than a few in the church, are following in this same tradition. Now hear me out. By this, I just simply mean as opposed to doing things God's way and following His direction on how we should live and what we should do, many are now listening to their gut or instinct or their feelings. They listen to their peers or the self-proclaimed experts on TED's talk. And some, without ever even thinking about God and His Word and what He directs, seek professional counseling for career and marital advice. 
sounds like they're following the same tradition. I suppose, you know, this would be somewhat understandable for those who don't know God. But those who profess to know him, like the, the Pharisees and, and the scribes, church, they're really without excuse. After all, we read this in Amos chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. This is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. In other words, come to me, not others, because I have everything you need. I will give you wisdom and direction. Don't go to others. You come to me. First and foremost. Psalm 73, verse 24, Asap acknowledges the same fact as well. It reads, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you take me to glory. Of course, Jesus also told us in John chapter 16, verse 13, that the part of the reason he was going to heaven was to send the Holy Spirit. Why? So that we could be guided in all truth. So again, we see this tradition of trusting in our own ingenuity or resourcefulness, or even holiness for that matter. We see this is not at all what God had in mind for us. And why is that? Well, the simple truth is we were designed to be in a real and abiding relationship with God. A, a relationship that is built upon loving Him always, communicating with Him continually, and trusting in Him consistently and walking hand in hand with Him each and every day of our lives for all eternity. This is what God had in mind for us. This is what He intended. And when we follow the tradition of the self-righteous, the clever, and the wisdom of this world, as opposed to the tradition of trusting God to direct our steps as Jesus did, who only ever said and did the things the Father directed him to do, friends, we can actually harm our relationship with God. And this is because, listen, God wants us to be completely dependent upon him. Now, I realize sometimes we think we just we need to grow up and we can just handle this on our own. That is not Scripture. God wants us dependent upon Him, to remain dependent upon Him. Why? Because this keeps us connected to Him. When you look at the Lord's Prayer, what is it? Give us today our daily bread. Why? Because we can't go out and earn bread? No, because it keeps us connected to God. Give me the most basic things, Father. It keeps us connected to God. Honestly, I, I think the lesson for us today out of this text is to remember what the Pharisees and the scribes forgot. And that is to live by faith and, and be a people of faith we must listen for and accept God's voice and direction for our lives. We must seek Him before trusting in ourselves or our own instincts, our feelings, or most certainly the wisdom of the day. Only by doing so can we avoid carrying on a, a tradition of what I think is meaningless religion. You know, if you can do it without God, you don't really need Him. We need to remain dependent upon God. Today, church, we have looked at what I think are some harmful uh, traditions. Traditions that should be avoided at all costs. Jesus addressed these specific traditions as he accused the scribes and Pharisees of the following things. The first was, again, their hypocrisy, which was, again, not professing one thing and living out something different. That's not the definition 
used here. Rather, he was telling them about their arrogance and hardness of heart. They were, he told them, utterly devoid of sincerity and genuineness. They were so far from God, but they thought they had it all together. So far from God. And I think sometimes in our culture, we can think we're so smart that we too have it all figured out. My buddy Doug over there in the corner, one of the wisest guys I know, he says, you always have to leave room for the mystery of God. Take that home with you. You're never going to know it all. So let's not be arrogant and think we're the only ones with the answer. You got to leave room for the mystery of God. See, and you thought I didn't pay any attention to you, didn't you? <laughs> Secondly, Jesus accused the scribes and Pharisees of having substituted the efforts of man for the laws of God. Which again, they were absolutely uh, guilty of. In fact, so much so, they didn't really need God any longer. Not to be holy. Not to live out a righteous life. Man, it all figured out. And sadly, and this is the painful part, they taught others to do exactly the same. And today, this tradition continues on, both in our world and in the church. It's almost like another great awakening, you know. And we just get it all figured out. We're just so smart. We got it all figured out. Look at our world. You figure out we ain't got it figured out. <laughs> you know, one of the things I was thinking about as I was writing out that last point is, Think about this tradition we, we pass on sometimes even to our, our children. We say things like this because we were told things like this. Because our parents were told things like this. Be strong and independent. Were you told that? Be strong and independent. But is that scriptural? Nope. Be strong in faith and dependent upon God. But strong and independent, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture, yet we pass that tradition along. You can do anything if you set your mind to it. For can you do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you? So we pass these traditions on, and they can be quite harmful. Worship team, please come. As we conclude our teaching this morning, I really want to encourage you Thank you. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Thank you. It's tradition, Chrissy. Where's my drummer? As we move into this, uh, this Christmas season, I, I think... Uh, one of the things we really need to be mindful of is, is do, do share tradition, do, do do the things. But let's be really mindful of the tradition of, of loving others. Let's, let's be mindful of the more important and weightier traditions as we move into this season. Please don't get all caught up in the things that are just going to rob you of life, rob you of income, rob you of joy. Fixate on the things of God. Fixate on the things of God. Commit to doing those things. I think there are others, uh, perhaps among us, who, um, I, I don't know how this message uh, hit uh, anyone, but I feel like there, there may be someone here today who feels like they have just been punched squarely in the chest, right here. Boom. Because I said something that just really hurt. Maybe because they realize now they're, they're living out a tradition 
of self-righteousness. They are living out a tradition that is unscriptural. That they're trying so hard to be good and they're trying so hard to be right. But they do feel distant from God. Now, I don't know if that's just me uh, feeling that that's, there's someone here. But if that speaks to you, I really want to encourage you, just reconnect with Christ. He's never far from any one of us. Just reconnect. Take a uh, second with me. Let, let's just pray for a moment and see what else the Lord might want to do. Holy Spirit, please come. Holy Spirit, come. The word confess, church, means to agree. And if you are feeling a sense of conviction uh, because, you know, you, you have uh, trusted more in the world's wisdom than in the Word of God, uh, maybe you're trusting in others to guide you and direct you uh, before you're trusting in, in uh, the Lord's direction, which is, you know, it's written in 66 books. He, he does speak to us today um, in, in various ways. Uh, but if you feel like, you know, you, you, you have kind of abandoned uh, those things and, you, and you're trusting in others and other wisdom, um, if, if you're feeling conviction, then, then I would encourage you to, to confess that, to, to agree with the Lord that you're right and this, this is where I've been. Um, because I feel like God wants to um, just mend your relationship with him. Remember, you know, you can look to other things or you can look to God, and God really does want you dependent upon him and clinging to him. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. If there is anything else you, you, you feel that you need from the Lord, encouragement, maybe you need a healing today, I would encourage you to, to please come and allow the Lord to uh, minister to you. Spirit of the Lord, come. In Jesus' name, amen.
next song is a good song to pray to the Lord to search your heart for any of those things that Danny was asking us to search our heart for. Purify my heart Let me be as gold And precious silver Purify my heart Let me be as gold today. Lord, may it uh, be inspired by your spirit to be always honoring and glorifying you and encouraging others, but encouraging others especially to get closer to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you guys next week.